Hey, this is Zach from W Freelancing. Today, we've got Brennan Dunn on the podcast, and he's going to be talking about running a scaled agency and his transition from running an agency into running software products. And on that note, part of Brennan's transition, as you know, is that he went from running his agency to running W Freelancing to running software products like Write Message, Palladio, and now his Create and Sell newsletter. And so as a part of that, Brennan has had his hands in a lot of pots. And one of the questions I want to ask him today on the interview is about managing so many pots at once. And the fact that I am even here asking this question goes to show that too many pots equals too much work. So to help <laughs> you, the longtime listener, bridge this gap between hearing Brennan's voice all the time and hearing this new Zach dude's voice, Brennan, maybe you can say a few words about the various pots and the transitions and introducing this Zach guy before we start the proper interview. Yeah. So if you're on the email list, which you should be, uh, Zach is going to not, is not going to be a stranger. You've been hearing from him for the last, it's been six months about something like that. A while, good amount of time. Um, anyway, if you, if you're a longtime listener and you're not on the newsletter, then you're probably used to hearing me say, hey, welcome to the Business of Freelancing Podcast, or the W Freelancing Podcast is what it later became, where we help you, uh, I'm trying to remember actually what our catchphrase was, <laughs> it was build a better life freelancing, have a, have a happier, health, healthier, and wealthier life freelancing. Anyway, something like that. It's been four years, I think, since we've had an episode. So in that time, yeah, I've, like Zach mentioned, I've, I have my hands in a good amount of pots. Since then, I not only have landed a book deal, which has taken a ton of time, um, but I also have inherited a, uh, a, a software company that I co-founded. Now I'm the only founder of. And um, my other project, Create and Sell, has taken up loads of my time. So um, back last autumn, I wanted to really find effectively a successor, somebody who thought like I did, was a little more put together in a lot of ways than I am and who could really do double your freelancing well. Because the, to be completely honest, I let it stagnate because I overestimated um, how much time and energy I had. And speaking of time and energy, I listed out all those projects. I forgot to mention the biggest project, which was I had a baby <laughs> with my wife, Small human. Um, which they can be a bit uh, demanding. So yeah, anyway, Zach is awesome. Um, if you are not on the email list, again, get on it. He's sending incredible information every week to W Freelancing. Um, but if you are a longtime listener and used to me, we thought we'd kick off the inaugural episode with Zach as the host, with him talking to me about something that he doesn't have direct experience at, which is kind of scaling up an agency um, and then transitioning to products. But that's the good thing is, he has experience and knowledge and everything that I never had and vice versa. So we're hoping to kind of expand out um, W Freelancing away from being kind of a Brennan's own anecdotal experience to being Brennan and Zach and the community of 50,000 others who make up W Freelancing and kind of when one of us wins, we all win kind of attitude. So that's And plan. that's a good segue into the theme for today's interview. So as you said, I, um, I haven't run a big, big uppercase M marketing agency bespoke scaled agency before. And this interview is part of the start the right type of business course. Hmm. And basically, uh, for people who are in DYF University, I've already released the first module in this course where we essentially lay out the framework for how to pick the right type of business based on your values goals and work lifestyle balance kinds of priorities. And what I'm doing now is interviewing different business owners who have experience with the different kinds of businesses that, uh, that you can work towards. And what I'm really looking forward to about this one with Brennan is that he was running a scaled bespoke agency, although it, I think you guys had a more honed service offering as I, it's funny, like we talk all the time and I know about your present day businesses, but I don't know a lot about your agency life. So we'll have to dig into that. But as I understand, it was a software agency, 11 people on staff, and you were mostly, I think you said once, you were mostly building MVPs for like apps for companies that already existed or something like that. What, what were you guys doing? Yeah. So we, okay. So when we started out, um, we kind of started accidentally. So it was me being a freelancer 
and a uh, San Francisco funded startup wanted more of me. So what I did was I turned to friends of mine who I had met at conferences, industry conferences, and basically said, hey, will you help me on this project? And that that was kind of the beginning of what became the company We Are Titans. And I needed a name. It sounded cool. I studied Greek stuff in college. So there we go. I, you know, so I incorporated We Are Titans Inc. Uh, back in 2008. Um, so built up this kind of remote team that was distributed. We were just really working on a single client project. And then other startup-y kind of clients who really initially needed just more keyboards thrown at the project, so they needed more developers, uh, came to me and said, hey, you know, to, to you and your started using team. And I was like, okay, this is cool. Do you <laughs> and your team have any any bandwidth or availability? And of course I uh, I said yes, but I didn't. So I found more people to, <laughs> to to help me, people that I knew, people who were freelancing. We were doing Ruby on Rails, so we're Ruby on Rails freelancers. And the basically the 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 argument I made to them was what if you just got paid a slightly less, but you don't need to worry about sales or project management or dealing with invoices or any of that stuff. You sit in the cafe with headphones on in your text editor and you code. So that was kind of the the way we started. And then eventually I wanted to make it a little more official than just this kind of a bunch of independent contractors and me. Um, so I effectively converted the company, still maintaining that that one whale client, but also the other clients that we had into a brick and mortar company in Norfolk, Virginia, which is where I lived, got an office space, had a bunch of Ikea desks, didn't have enough employees at first. So I made it our first co-working space in the area, which was just my way of thinking, well, it'd be a little awkward just having me in a giant cavernous room on my own. So let's invite some people. Got one person took me up on that, a guy named Marty. And, uh, but eventually I ended up hiring a salesperson first, Zach. And then I ended up just building the team up from there. Um, and that's so, not me for the record. No, I was a Zach. salesperson. That was, yeah. Keep going. That was Zach Miller. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of the origin story of it. Um, and obviously there's things I had to kind of learn on the way. Like I had always accidentally gotten clients by waiting for referrals. And obviously when you've got 11 people on payroll and your spend, your payroll expense is 60,000 a month, which ours was, um, you can't just hope that you get a new client in July that will make, give you that much money. So I had to get a little more intentional about that. Um, that led to us kind of building up a community presence, doing some things that eventually led us to work with a presidential candidate, a uh, company in Japan, a uh, company in Germany, um, and just basically com companies really all over the country uh, predominantly. But yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but eventually I kind of got bit by the whole, um, this was 2010, 2011, took an online course called 30 by 500 by Amy Hoy and Alex Hillman, which is actually still around. And it was one of the first versions of it. And um, their whole thing was, how do you get uh, 500 people paying you $30 a month, right? So I kind of like the idea of having 500 people paying me a little bit of money instead of like four active big clients paying a lot of money who are very demanding and very like, Hey, we need this done by Monday. Can you work late? Can your team work late? And blah, 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 blah. I like the uh, kind of, you know, the, the the geeky developer in me was like, I like the idea of just people showing up and plugging in a credit card and buying. Um, so yeah, that's what led me to eventually, uh, I didn't sell the company, but I basically handed it over to my second in command and said, I'm getting a perpetual revenue share of this, um, because I, I built this thing from scratch and, um, he did that for a few years and then he eventually kind of withered out because to be honest, I was the salesperson. Um, I was the one bringing the deals. So there was some kind of residual stuff, but then it just kind of faded out, which was fine because by then I had built up um, another company called PlanScope. That was my first software company called PlanScope. And the blog of that, that was project management for freelancers. So the blog of that became the articles you see now on W Freelancing. So when I sold that company in 2015 or 2016, part of the deal was you get the you get the SaaS, you get the app, but I keep the content marketing stuff. I keep the email list and I keep the um, blog. And yeah, that was it's kind of what led me to what I'm doing these days. Cool. 
So for today, the main focus. So I, I Zach, am most interested in your product businesses because I, Zach, want to start a product business. And I think a lot of the listeners do as well. But the, uh, the thing that I really want to tap into specifically today, so we're going to have to massage this interview. Uh, sorry for the mic bump. The thing that I want to tap into specifically today is the bespoke agency. And I also want to kind of have you compare the advantages and disadvantages of the bespoke agency versus these product-based businesses and stuff. Because uh, I know that there was a period where I think, I don't know how it lines up with your timeline, but I want to say it was like probably after you were transitioning into PlanScope, that was when you did like the Pat Flynn email marketing project to get some quick cash from consulting or something like that, right? Like was that after you'd transitioned out of the agency? Pat Flynn, no, I did a, um, I've worked with Pat, but it was a workshop I did for his team just a few years back. But that yeah. wasn't. Okay. I think that's what I'm thinking yeah. of. Like, Okay. Basically, I remember you did some consulting work that was high ticket consulting work when you needed oh, to yeah. get a stack of cash in a short amount of time. And yes. that was after you transitioned out of the agency, right? Yeah. No. So what that was, that's what led me to selling double your freelancing rate as an ebook. Um, so I had built up PlanScope was my SaaS. Again, 2011, this is back when like Stripe was relatively new. And software was kind of software as a service was kind of a newish thing. Um, I don't really know what I was doing, but I got it up to a few thousand a month, but a few thousand a month compared to the money I was making before consulting was peanuts. Mm -hmm. Um, so I really, I, I was able to budget for it because the residual money from the, the agency plus the plan scope money was making me break even, but there was an event, a uh, conference called FunConf I wanted to go to in Ireland that I just didn't, hadn't budgeted for. Um, and I wanted to go. So I ended up actually, as a way of fundraising for that, I pre-sold a book uh, called W Freelancing Rate, which 10 years on has now become a full-fledged course. Um, but yes, that was my first kind of time doing that. I also did, as I started really getting into the early email marketing stuff, I did get on the radar of a few companies that wanted to work with me um, for a lot of money. So that was companies like Gumroad, uh, they ended up hiring me. Um, that was, uh, it's now called NoCo, but it used to be called Frickle Time Tracking and various software companies effectively who saw what I was doing with email marketing. This is back in my infusions off days. Um, liked kind of the approach I was bringing. This is my early attempts at segmentation and personalization. Um, and they were saying, hey, it's cool that you're publicly blogging about the results you're getting. What if you did it for a real business like ours? <laughs> Basically was there. You're thinking. Cool. All right. So all of this for you, the listener, this is essentially just preface. Mm -hmm. Let me establish for all of us how this interview will flow. So, um, so essentially, and this will be for you to know as well, Brennan, um, the, the premise behind this course is the idea that there's, there's sort of a difference between like business models and business structures. And what I want to focus on here are the business structures, because the business structure is like ha how you set up a business in the first place to either fulfill a product for customers or a service for clients. And business models within that, like packaging or pricing, those can change relatively easy, but business structures are like slow course corrections. And essentially today, what I want to do, the way that this will flow, I first want to talk about the quote, dope end state. So Brennan running his scaled agency, that's kind of the main focus for today. We can also talk about the transition into products because that is a key part of Brennan's story. And I will be interviewing other seven and eight figure agency owners to kind of talk more about that dope end state of a scaled bespoke agency. Uh, but for me, I only ever grew my agency to a few people and a couple hundred thousand in revenue, whereas Brennan was in the several million in revenue. Uh, so he can speak to a lot of things I can't. And he probably conquered a lot of the challenges that I ran into. So he can speak to all that stuff, whereas all I could speak to is the challenges that I kind of stopped at. So we'll talk about the dope end state. And then I want to flow from there into the journey to get there, which Brendan spoke to a little bit in the intro. And from there, the segue is kind of into a, is this business structure right for you section? So what I'll be doing in that section, that's kind of the, to me, the core part of this interview is 
Number one, learning what makes Brennan tick, learning what Brennan's values and goals and priorities are for what, what he would define as a good business so that you, the listener, can, I guess, kind of decide what advice or what experience he's had are actually relevant to you. Because I think the trouble if someone just throws around revenue numbers is that it's like this little dangled carrot that sounds so tempting and interesting. But a lot of the time, certain business models just aren't good fits for certain kind of people. And uh, what I think will be really interesting about Brennan's perspective in that section is that I know that Brennan's work style and work priorities have changed a lot over the years just from talking with him. And so that'll be really funded again too. So once we have those fundamentals established, we'll then talk about some like pros and cons of this business structure relative to other structures, and then we'll wrap up. That's kind of how this whole thing will flow. So uh, Brennan, when I'm interviewing you today, the the main things that I want you to be thinking of when I'm asking you these questions are like, when should someone listening choose your business model, which in this case, we're focusing on like a scaled bespoke agency, mm-hmm. seven figure bespoke agency. When should someone choose that business model versus or business structure rather versus a different one? When should someone go for a scaled bespoke agency versus a productized agency or versus a leveraged soloist or versus a product agency, things like that. So that's kind of, that's the picture I'm trying to paint. That's the gap I'm trying to fill with this interview. So one thing that I think would be just nice to establish is um, let's say that you were at like a networking event. And you were repping We Are Titans. That's that'll for everything I ask you today. We Are Titans will be the primary business we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so if you were at a networking event and someone was like, just saying, "What do you What do you do?" kind of thing, what would you say in terms of we help X Y Z type of person do blank? What would your templated answer for that kind of question be? So I'm going to cheat and say it depends on the kind of networking event. Um, so we. I regularly would go to different conferences along with local networking events. And I knew that if I go to a startup conference and get asked that question, my response will change depending versus like if I'm talking to a banker, let's say from the area. But usually let's say I'm, I'm at a local networking event. And I did, I, there was a local networking event that was monthly called Critical Mass. And we went to a little Irish pub type thing and it would be like real, real estate agents and bankers and just kind of like a, if you're familiar, if anyone listening is familiar with like BNI as a group, imagine that, but without the membership fee. So um, usually my, my mistake early on was I told people I owned a Ruby shop, which would be fine if I went to a Ruby on Rails conference instead of that. But most people are thinking I'm a, I'm a, a jeweler. Yeah. So there. you make me a ring? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but no, I mean, so what that, what that eventually evolved into was our thing was we got really good at helping companies who back then, this is like pre-Dropbox, were, were doing a lot of like things out of Excel and then emailing a file around the office and like using it, whether it be for a CRM or a project management thing or whatever else. And our thing that we got really good at was we help take existing workflows that you have in your business right now. And we build custom software that helps you basically execute on all that a lot better. So that could include auditing, that could include um, you know, notifications and, and things like that, right? So that became our bread and butter, working with SMBs locally who 50 to 100 employees, I can think of an insurance company, a local insurance company. And they just need something a bit custom that, um, that, they don't have at the minute. So a lot of the events that we did, local events, we started with the Chamber of Commerce and we eventually started doing, doing our own events were things like uh, build versus buy. So most of our customers went into it thinking the people who build custom software are Microsoft and IBM, not us. Uh, because it seemed like you you just don't, like the average SME doesn't build custom software. But we let them know that like you could actually affordably create web-based software that's just for yourself. And it can be done fairly quickly. And over the long haul, it'll be better for you and your business. So that was kind of our the angle that we took predominantly. But we eventually, you know, that, that was that's how we marketed ourselves, you know, locally. But we we always really enjoy playing with other people's money. And that meant like going for uh the kind of the startup, you know, the 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 quintessential like 
business guy who raised some money and has 200 grand in a bank account and needs an MVP built. Um, we love those projects because they were kind of like not boring workflow software. They were instead like social networks or something like that. Um, so we did a lot of those too, but our, our bread and butter was these kind of custom workflowy things that companies would use internally. Cool. And like, I guess the modernized, the modernized approach to it might be a, um, this is something that Davide and the community has been thinking about. The modernized approach might be like a multi-phasic thing where phase one for the smaller business would be like patching together various existing no platforms things. or no code yeah. tools. And then phase two, once a sort of threshold hit is building software. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this was like so many of the things in retrospect nowadays could have been done with like Airtable and Zapier. Yeah. You know, but th <laughs> again, this is before. Yeah. Yeah. And the vibe I'm getting is like th the fundamental thing that you did is still super relevant, which is you, you found processes that were happening and were inefficient and you made them better. That's relevant. It's the how that's changed. Um, and I know that the process, basically the, the blueprint is essentially you merging the process that worked for your business with your knowledge of internet marketing mm -hmm. into like a kind of a hybrid thing. Uh, and so with that said, I know if it, if it were me and I were to say, okay, let's say I want to build a cool app for a local insurance company, like how do I even get in front of them? How do I talk to a key stakeholder at a, an employee, like a 50 to 100 employee company? Like how did, how did those kinds of relationships come about? Yeah. So for us, they came about largely from our network. Um, so we did a lot of networking and what we ended up doing, which is something I still advocate to this day is I had a friend named Keith who he did this thing that I always thought was pretty clever. It, he was part of the networking circuit. You saw the same guys at every event inevitably like there'd be a core group of us who went to everyone um and and this guy keith did a thing called coffee with the ceo where he basically told people at the event like he'd do the look you know you go up and you talk to somebody a conversation for five minutes you're both holding a beer you exchange business cards and then you go to the next guy um what keith did that i thought was really clever is he invited people and said hey every i forgot the day it was like thursday every thursday at 10 a.m i'll be at this panera bread on military highway and um we could just come in like we'll talk shop he he was a he ran a design kind of company so he it was like you could come and you could talk about like what you're doing with design or website design or whatever um and it was just this open invitation to come and kind of talk with him about what he knows a lot about and that led him to get a lot of clients so we did a variation on that and we ended up telling people instead of doing the ritualistic exchange of business cards when talking with somebody at a networking event we would instead say we're putting together kind of a a again this is before the day of newsletter or before newsletters were really a thing but just we're putting together a local group of people interested in the t in the intersection between technology and business would you be interested in going and these are people the people who go to these events are networking fiends so they all say yes so what what i would do is i would get the stack of business cards at the end of the night usually the next day and just we had a mailchimp account back then i didn't really know what i was doing with email but we had a mailchimp account because they were really, I think, the only email platform I'd heard of. Um, so I would just key them in manually and do it uh, and add them as contacts. And then over time, we eventually got a few dozen of these. And that's what propelled us to start doing our own events. So we were effectively siphoning, in, siphoning off the audience from other established events. So think the Critical Mass Group I talked about, Chamber of Commerce, and so on, and getting them into our own audience. Again, this is before I even... I wouldn't have called it an audience back then because it was just not part of my vocabulary. Um, so anyway, that's that was kind of our way of doing it. And we started kind of thought leadering again, not knowing what, what we were talking about um, or not knowing that the, the phrase, but we would start talking about things we were reading. I was really big into a website called Hacker News back then that would post interesting articles about like tech things. And I'd occasionally kind of curate Brennan's thoughts on something that's happening. Um, and yeah, uh, I mean, that's what led to us using our office space for events and we invite people to do these events. We do things like when we launched a project, especially if it was a local client, we would go to a bar and we'd invite our list and say, come on out first drinks on us. And the idea there is we're celebrating our ability to ship 
a business improvement for that person right there who is our client. Um, and all this stuff really worked well. And again, we were hyper local. We did, I mentioned earlier, we had clients in like Japan and Germany and all over the US. And that really came about more accidentally through people who were in our local network who had connections elsewhere. So that's, I think, what a lot of, to go back to your question about how do you get inside that insurance company? We weren't doing a lot of what I talked about in the blueprint about kind of Trojan horsing your way in with an interview request or whatever else. We weren't doing that at the early stages. Instead, what we were doing is we were just building up a, a network and realizing 95% of the people here will never, they're, they're useless in, in the sense that they're never going to be clients or refer us or anything like that. But we just kept playing that game again and again, and that got us introductions into these companies and so on. So that was kind of our approach. And it was kind of a build up, you know, if you think of why referrals happen, um, and I think I talk about this in the blueprint is referrals usually happen because you have a, have a client, you deliver value to them. They associate you with a delivery, a, like making their life better in some material way. So then they're willing to kind of pass on that, that when a friend or a peer says, Hey, do you know anyone who can X? That's how that referral happens. So we were able to kind of expand our client base. Um, even though they weren't paying clients, these were people who had gotten value from us in one way or another. And that's where these referrals came from. So we kind of built up this army of referral partners who were mostly local that had international reach. Yeah, it reminds me of like, as, as you're talking, I'm asking myself, what's the 2023 equivalent? Equivalent, <laughs> yes. And uh, it kind of reminds me of how these days, like I'm in some Facebook groups for like online businesses or SaaS or whatever. And the person who put on this group, like I'm thinking of one SaaS specific group that I'm in, the person who put on the group was like kind of starting a fledgling SaaS company when he started the group. But now he, because he's running his SaaS alongside this group and he's posting his own learnings and stuff, now if he wants to position himself as like an authority on teaching you how to run a SaaS, like, it's one of those things where anyone who's in that group, if they're asking themselves, who who should I ask if I want to learn how to run a SaaS? Oh, maybe this dude who runs the group that's always sharing these good pieces of info. Exactly. What do you think? Because um, in the blueprint, we we talk about the the Trojan horse approach and stuff, and I think that's that's great and in so many ways an improvement. But I'm also curious, like if if we look at the the creating a community aspect of what what you did with these live events and stuff like it doesn't sound quite as quite as easy of a sell to say hey i'm running a mastermind online do you want to come hang out on zoom so what do you think like if anything what is the 2023 equivalent of what you did or is it just that you do something else i mean i think it's a bit like okay so take take what i'm doing these days with the right message so yes i had a bit of a cheat code in that i've done this before and to be honest some of the early right message audience came from the W freelancing side of things. But to be honest, the, the Venn diagram overlap is very, very minimal. So what I started to do was I started to be really authoritative about what personalized marketing is. And for, for me, that actually kind of meant, and outside of the enterprise, that really was never discussed. The enterprise obviously does it because they have armies of engineers. Um, the average SMB doesn't do personalization. So I had to find a way to distill down what I was researching about what enterprise people are doing when it comes to personalization and make it apply to the average Joe business owner. So that was my thinking there. And I think there's a lot that could be said about if your job is to curate, curate information, distill it down, refine it, reshape it. And again, a lot of people are doing this with the whole newsletter craze these days, but you don't need to be, I think, I think a lot of people because those of us kind of in the know, we know the shape of the market. We know that there's a lot of people who are kind of in the like SaaS authority world. We look at Dan Martell. We look at these people. We look at all these people who are in the SaaS world. But the average person doesn't know the, the landscape like we do. So all you need to do is just make yourself that curated expert person for a, a small subset of people to start. And then you can start to think about how do I create my own content? How do I then, you know, once I've done it, you know, one person that does this really well is um, her name's Chanel. I always forget her last name, but Chanel, her Twitter handle is growth in reverse. But what she does is she goes and like reverse engineers all these creators online who are building amazing businesses. And she is 
kind of in a weird and an interesting way applying the Trojan horse technique here by doing these massive in-depth things where she's looking at public data that people have shared over Twitter usually about their list growth rate and about their sales and like what they're doing and so on and so forth and digs through and researches for a whole week a creator and then writes a ma mammoth newsletter that is an in-depth analysis without her interviewing these people, but just looking at public data and saying, this is the, the story of X. Um, and what that's done is that's built her up a really community of people who look at her as an, as, as an expert in this. Um, Sam Hewlett did this with, um, what was the name of that? His, his thing he did, uh, some, some website here. No, some like app teardowns.com or something like that. But anyway, what he did is he put together basically like slide decks of saying, oh, was it user onboarding or something? Anyway, he he would like show the onboarding process of like mint.com or whatever. And he'd like rip into it as a UX person and say, this could be better. I'd do this instead of that. And he wasn't actually, he was just, he was getting himself into these, into this high profile name as a expert in all things user onboarding. And Chanel is doing the same thing now. And Chanel is doing a lot of ridiculous level consulting at the minute with the people that she's tearing down publicly because she's obviously publicly expressing how good she is at this stuff in a way that even the best copywritten website for a marketing site for herself couldn't do the same. You know, you, you could have the best sales website, but nothing beats what she's doing with that newsletter and her in-depth analysis. So that's giving people like, hey, she obviously knows what she's doing. She's demonstrating that publicly and she's using this as a way to kind of get in and getting to know people like Justin Welsh and all these people, uh, Sahel Bloom and everything. And then now she's being asked to speak at FinCon and she's speaking in events now. And like, the, I think a lot of people re don't realize always that like, these people weren't born as speakers. These people weren't born with like a massive Twitter audience or email list or whatever else. They got there because they built in public, which is what I just described it. So that's why I'm so bullish on like whatever the Trojan horse method means for you. What Chanel does is an example of that. Um, what Sam Hulick does is an example of that. The more uh, offline way would be a lot of what I described, say in the blueprint, where it's the whole like knock or LinkedIn message, the person at a local business that would be like your ideal client and get to know them in a way that's non-threatening. Um, you could do that through networking. You can do that highly advise, even if you think the whole thing is kind of, I don't know, tacky and getting involved in local networking events, just so you have practice and experience in talking with people at a high level about what you do. Because if you just talk to people like me or Zach, or you go to like industry conferences, you're so, you're so in a bubble that that's fine. If you're looking for clients who are like, I know I need a Ruby on Rails developer and I know exactly what needs to be done. We just are struggling to recruit. So, Hey, Brendan's available for hire done. If that's the kind of client you want, keep doing that. But if you want to start doing what I did, which was getting people with actual problems and being able to value price that and go away from like the market rates of what a developer in front of a keyboard costs, that's the approach you're going to want to take. Yeah. And it comes down, it comes down to a lot more than that too. Like even if somebody didn't care about those things and they simply wanted to do systematic lead generation, you, you, there's kind of not a good way to, to do systematic marketing as a freelancer or agency owner without going into that like thought leadership space at least mm -hmm. a bit because because education even if you're not doing content marketing in air quotes education is still so foundational to having a good funnel and converting your clients and being seen as an authority figure and being able to charge good rates and being picked over competitors and stuff so yeah i, I love what you're saying and you know i've i've had this kind of thing on the mind as i've been sort of steeped in the DYF Accelerator community, which by the way, you can join at dyf.link slash dyfa, um, as people are working through the blueprint and I'm thinking about, you know, how do we lower this barrier to people having their first Trojan horse conversations and things like that? And that's, I want to try to not let myself go down, down this rabbit hole too much because we should do this in a separate interview since yeah. today is the start the right type of business thing. But what I am loving about what you're saying is that when I'm thinking of the modern equivalent, like what I'm thinking about is the fact that 
I think that the biggest objection I hear, and and you heard it too, because it's literally in the blueprint you're trying to ad address this objection is, how do I get my foot in the door with these conversations and these Trojan horse interviews when I don't have an audience yet? I'm I'm nothing. I'm nobody. But what I love about the way that you kind of just put it there is like, and I'm and I'm thinking how to translate it into 2023. When a person commits to helping a certain type of person or or helping with a certain type of problem they are essentially like they're doing what you described with chanel like when chanel decided i am going this is gonna be my thing i'm just gonna reverse engineer what works on day zero or day one she depending if you're a developer or not right uh she didn't have any of that knowledge so she didn't have any value to share but suppose she even spent a freaking hour a day mm -hmm. like reverse engineering what was working or an hour a day having conversations about what was working. How many weeks would it take before she had something interesting to share when she was interviewing some somebody about what's working? Like how long until she had something interesting to share with that person that she got from another one? Answer, not very long. Yeah. Me running the accelerator, I have gotten ideas from accelerator members that I now have shared with other accelerator members. And it's one of those things like, this very interview that I'm on with you now is an example of like what you're describing in action. You know, you you're immersing yourself in the stories of people who you care about and you're learning what works for them and you're using the information you get from them to help these other people who you're talking about. And that's when we distill this back to what you were saying way back in the 2010 days of like, we're putting on a group that is the intersection of technology and business. Like mm -hmm. it's you essentially just saying, I'm committed to helping business owners learn whatever kind of thing. That's what Chanel said. That's what Sam said. Like, I'm, my commitment is that I am helping you learn what these pros are doing with UX. I am not some uber master guru at UX. I am just, I've got a little bit of knowledge and I'm picking apart what these others are doing. And, and that's like, that's my thing. And I'm yeah. helping anyone who cares about it. So that's cool. I like that. Let me rewind us to get me back on track. So I think this is great though. And we'll do a standalone interview on this. So we we have some context now about how you guys were getting clients. And it sounds like there wasn't any specialization in like an industry. You didn't have any sort of like specific niche. You were just kind of helping medium-sized businesses make their Excel sheets into and, and complete software. startups. Okay. You know, and soft. Yeah. Person with a lot of money somehow got it. Yeah. And so in terms of the services that you performed when you were running, like if you consider your agency in its heyday, like when when it was doing the best, yep. uh, when you were doing that, like what, how did your your revenue break down? Was it mostly development work, like software builds, or or was it was there a pie chart that divided different ways? Yeah. So what we actually publicly sold was when we started out, it was all hourly. Because I don't know any better. Um, but what we transitioned into eventually was this kind of team-based approach where for a set fee, you would get two full-time developers, one of which is more senior. You would get a part-time designer helping implement interfaces and forms and that kind of thing. And part-time project management who would be in charge of making sure everything's just running smoothly. And obviously that designer and, and project manager would kind of be between multiple projects. And that was our that was our package. So the benefit there is we we charged a weekly iteration rate, um, and by doing it that way, there was no visibility in terms of, well, what what am I? How many development hours am I getting? How many design hours? How many project? It was just like we used a tool called Pivotal Tracker, which is still around, still a great tool, which would let you give um, story points to tasks, and then eventually it would let you establish a velocity, which meant given a period of time, like a week, how many points do you typically ship? So we would do um, in our road mapping and also in our continuous planning, we would story story card out everything and say, okay, this is an eight point story. This is a five point story. This is a three point story. And then once we knew we had a cadence of a 40, 50 points per week, we could then determine, obviously it's all relative. So there's nothing, don't read into that too much, but uh, we would be able to know, okay, given given all the scope that they give that that's in the pipeline, this is now five iterations. We charge X per week per iteration. 
this is the budget. We're still billing for time. So if they added more scope and went into six iterations, obviously now they're going to pay us more. But it was never a uh, a matter of them getting a uh, line item invoice of yep. like this many hours for this person. The old Brennan Dunn quote about not showing how the sausage factory works. Correct. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's the next best thing to fix. You know, the I, perfect world, we would have fixed priced everything from day one. But our projects were so greenfield most of the time that we didn't really fully know all the what the final scope would look like going into it. Which was why time based billing is always nice because, sure, client, you want to like add this idea you came up with in the shower this morning? Cool. But it'll take a week. week. Yeah. Pay me more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so when you were at your peak heyday, whatever, what was your team size and structure? So how many people in general and what were different people doing? I think yep. it was 11, so right? Uh, okay. 11. Yep. So it would be me. We had a basically like a office admin person who did all the like scheduling and administrative invoicing ran to the bank because we were getting paid for checks so did the bank runs and all that kind of stuff we had not you zach different zach <laughs> uh who was basically the sales person we had a uh, full-time designer and then we had um where am i where am i at so you are at four people Okay, so then the other uh, the other seven of us were developers. Wow, so one full time designer for seven devs. Mm, yeah, we didn't do a lot of most clients. To be honest, had their own design mm. uh, that they we partnered with an agency actually out of the UK, which is where I now live. That usually what we do is we had like a reciprocal thing where if they needed like a full blown marketing site and a full full blown like app design type thing, um, they would usually like Photoshop it out because that's what you did back then. Um, and we would then, uh, our designer was more, think of them a more front end person. So they would go and, um, take photos, PSD documents and make them into, uh, HTML and CSS. And mm, then, okay. um, obviously our developers knew when you're doing Ruby on rails, you're kind of full stack. So you're going to know you're not purely backend, you're doing HTML, you're doing CSS. So you have enough knowledge there, but you're not a designer. Right. So yep. we had one person, um, Christy who handled all of that. And I think you said that you're you were burning sixty k a month. Was that just on payroll, or that was on like payroll office expenses? Like, what were your operating costs? So, we had a really good. Le uh, our rent was like eighteen hundred a month, um, which was downtown. So that was pretty good, I thought. Um, I wasn't as good as like at P and Ls back then as I should have been. <laughs> so, like, we bought IMAX when we needed them. Uh, the non-retina IMAX from way back then, but I always thought they looked nice. Um, <laughs> we had, we didn't really go, we didn't splurge on like office equipment or anything like that. Um, the, yeah, payroll was absolutely the big thing. Payroll was, I just remember 60,000 being like at our peak, what we were paying, um, every two weeks, basically every two weeks, 60 K. So 120 oh, no, K. No, we did payroll twice a month, but it was 60,000 okay. a month. Okay, yeah. okay. There we so go. it's 30 no, K no, every yeah. two weeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. So, it's been a while. yeah, and it, we're talking like 2011 or something. So I'm not going to hold you to exact numbers. Uh, or when when was the heyday though? Just to give us context. 2010, 2011. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you remember what your gross revenue was and your profit, roughly? Okay. Um, I want to say our gross revenue was about two million. So it wasn't it wasn't significant. Um, and that would put our expense, I think our expenses were about half that. Yeah. Cause it looks like payroll right. alone would have been like over 700 K then you got 800 K about yeah. taxes and then you yeah. got rent and then you got, I and I was doing insurance too, but again, I mean, you still have to, yeah, I mean, it was about, it came out to about a million probably. Um, but we were also factoring. So our, our expenses were slightly higher because. We would also, um, we did a lot of road mapping and it was dumb and I didn't actually make clients pay road mapping plus flights, plus hotel, plus per diem. Instead it was road mapping. Uh, so I usually ate the cost. So there was expenses there too, which yeah, I should have charged more for the road mapping to be honest, but we, I flew three of us to Tokyo for a week. Um, mostly cause I wanted to go to Tokyo for a week <laughs> and, um, we did road mapping out of their office 
there. Um, but I'm pretty positive we lost money doing that roadmap. We did it. We did a full build of a project afterward, so that was cool. We made money there, but um, we definitely lost money going to Japan. But it sounds like, like in general, because what I'm going to want to dig into as we flow through your history here and your transitions out, like it sounds like when you were running the agency and it was doing well, you were putting like about a million dollars a year into your bank account. Personally, yeah, yeah. Uh, well. After tax, or I guess you. into the business's profit bank account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I was clearing. I, I want to say I was clearing it in the heyday. I want to say eight hundred ish a year. Um, and I didn't get back there again until twenty sixteen, because it, it, it's at its heyday of W freelancing. I was clearing about nine hundred to a million a year personally. But the the agency, when it was in this baller end state that we're describing, was about 800K a year in your For me, bank yeah, account. personally. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so this is great then, because what I'm going to want to ask, like for me, the big the big personal fear that I have, which I know is my own roadblock for why, why I never tried to grow a bespoke agency, it's one of a few anyway, is that like keeping margins high enough to actually be able to take home that amount of money and that that percentage of profit when you have all those random expenses like flying out to Tokyo and buying new IMAX and insurance, like, like just all those little dumb things, but that when you're running a big ass business, they add up. Uh, so this is a good piece of context for us to know that Brennan was doing nearly a million dollars of revenue a year into his pocket and still made the transition away. So that's going to be really interesting to dig into when we're talking about what kind of business resonates with your own values and lifestyle goals and stuff like that. So Stay tuned for that because it's coming up. <laughs> this would be where we should do an ad spot, but I don't plan to have ads. But that, I just realized <laughs> that should be in the ad right there. Um, so when you were when you were in this heyday, and you were doing a couple million a year, how many individual clients were you working with a year? If you were to guess, I'd say in a given year we probably had about twenty five. Average and client budget was about a hundred thousand ish. Maybe a little less. And that's what I was going to ask is like, did it distribute where you had one like whale project and lots of smaller ones or were projects on average around 100K? Yeah. I mean, we had a, we had a smattering of like 50K projects. Usually our minimum was about 40. Um, and but we had like, I mean, the, the Silicon Valley funded one. I think they probably paid at least half a million to us over the lifespan of it. So it, it, it depended. And I think we we spoke to it well enough. So let's just kind of summarize our long tangent earlier. So it, this question I have down is like, where were your clients and leads primarily coming from? So if you were to give a one-liner answer to that, what would that be? Referrals. Referrals from our network that we intentionally built. Yeah. Yeah. So not just referrals, referrals from the network you intentionally built. I think that's key. Mm -hmm. So we've established the end state. Now... We are in the next phase of the interview, which I was supposed to mark a chapter. I forgot to mark chapters on my little stream deck. So the next phase of this interview is Brennan's journey to get to the quote, dope end state. So he spoke to it a bit earlier. Um, for people following along, I'm going to share my screen on this flow chart that I'm working on for the course. Still work in progress, so I'll be interested to see what Brennan has to say as we look at the different phases. Let me figure out how to share my screen in Riverside. All right. So if anyone is uh, listening to this as a podcast episode and they want to follow along later, the link for what I'm sharing is dyf.link forward slash business types. Um, so Basically, Brennan, what I want to, can you see my screen, Brennan? I see, I can't read any text, but I can see your screen, yes. But if I zoom in like this, you can read it, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll read this stuff out anyway for the podcast listeners. But basically, we have this, this flow chart that I'm working on where I feel like most, pretty much every person who becomes freelancer, agency owner, product business owner, almost always starts on this left node, which is like an employee at a job. And then they often flow left to right. And I'm, I'm curious to hear your and any other interviewees take, but it seems like people often flow left to right where you go from being an employee at a job to either 
doing something kind of like staff augmentation or being a freelancer with like one or two big ongoing projects or having several clients and relying on word of mouth. That's kind of this like basically unemployed territory. And then there's this like kind of a business, um, but with like employee leanings territory that that makes it a bit more of a business, but um, but it's still not like a real businessy business in that you still have very limited scalability. And then it kind of flows from there into like all these green ones where you're talking about being a scaled agency that's actually a business where you can spend your time on business growing activities or being a product based business. And so what I think will be kind of fun to do today, let me move my notion window over here, is to look at how your own flow mapped through this. So you said that when you first, like you were working as a Rails dev originally, right? Um, no, I, uh, well, kind of, I, I worked at a, I was hired actually as a Java developer, um, doing, this is kind of right out of, out of college. I was doing, um, there was a thing that called, there used to be a thing called back then it was Macromedia Flex, it became Adobe Flex, which was kind of like, um, flash client side and all the backend stuff was done with Java in our case. So I was doing that stuff. And then there was a video put out on the Apple website back in like 2007 that had David Hanemer Hansen and um, Jason Freed of back then 37 Signals coming down an elevator and looking really cool in their like badass loft office. And they were talking about this thing that they've all called Ruby on Rails. And in college, I'd seen that because a friend of mine uh, got me, this is back when Rails was shipped in like 2004. Five, I think for the first time. Um, and they had this video about like doing a photo uh, search engine on Flickr. And they were using text, what was the TextMate? I think was the editor or something that looked really cool. So I rushed out when I was in college and bought a Mac mini because I wanted a Mac to do that on because the text editor look, looked really nice. So I did a bit, of, a bit of Rails in college, but I didn't do anything serious with it until that video came out and my bosses were all into like all things Apple. And when Apple gave the stamp of approval on Ruby on Rails, they really didn't. They were just showcasing this cool agency. Um, <laughs> then they allowed me to start pioneering the shift from Java as our backend to Ruby on Rails. So I did that. And then, um, and then funny enough, that folded. I started a little, I don't talk about this much, but I started a startup with a friend back then where we were, re we were doing um, lead gen for uh, mortgage customers. Or yeah, so basically we, we basically were running ads nationwide. Traffic came to our site. I wrote some code that would geolocate the traffic and say, hey, you're in Florida, cool. Here's a Flor randomly pick a Florida client of ours who we have a credit or who has a credit with us. We would show a form, a branded form for them. It's personalization early on, show their logo, show their picture, all this stuff. That lead gets submitted. And then we uh, we would build a client 80 to hundred dollars for that lead. Um, and this is back when the alternative back then was Lending Tree, which was when banks compete, you win, which really just meant when a lead is generated, they're sold to 100 banks. <laughs> so if you're not the first person who calls, you're kind of screwed because every mortgage person offers the exact same product. Um, so we did personal one to one lead gen for mortgage companies, but then 2008 hit, the mortgage subprime bubble burst, and the whole industry collapsed. So then I was kind of out of that. And you were uh, side and hustling that while at the job at day job or that was no like i quit you the day the job, job to do that. i did this full time okay. i actually it's gonna be the the it's gonna sound like the spoiled rich kid thing but my dad lent us twenty thousand and invested in us my friend <laughs> anthony and i to start this we actually made decent money um but then it collapsed with a mortgage thing mm. um and then when it collapsed i went out and i found a job in miami beach where i was at an agency this is my first experience with an agency and I was doing what every agency builds their own content management system. And I was hired to build their content management system. But I got to, uh, the, the company worked with resorts and airlines. So I got to go to like Hawaii and got to go to like work with like Starwood, which was now owned by Marriott um, and different airlines like South Africa Airlines and Caribbean Airlines and stuff like that. And I got to like see how that worked and see saw how that like my bosses wine and dined them and did the whole like thing mm. um and that was my, my first kind of foray into that so i worked at that, that agency in miami beach and then uh moved up to virginia um so my uh my ex-wife got pregnant 
uh, and she wanted to be close to her family. So we moved up to Virginia. And then um, I worked remote for the company for a while. But then the company made the mistake, I think, of flying me out to a conference, the Web 2.0 conference out in San Francisco. Met a few people you to there. your first clients. Introduced me to my first clients. And <laughs> when I got back to Virginia, they were like, hey, we're on Rails, huh? And I was like, oh, I can moonlight. I could do this on the side. I'm remote. At nights and weekends, I could make some extra money. And that's what led to uh, all the freelancing stuff. And so you essentially then bounced from, from what you were saying earlier. And I want to keep this tight because we got a lot, a lot of the meat stuff to get through. But it sounds like you essentially bounced from being a solo kind of moonlighting uh, commoditized developer to yeah. like doing what a lot of us do, myself included, to like prematurely jumping to being kind of like an agency where you had your little team of other contractors who you're working with. Well, because you then, don't want to say no. You don't want to turn away the yeah. <laughs> somebody else comes to you randomly and you're like, oh yeah, I can help. And for me, what what happened for me is like when I took my first crack at an agency, like it was just it was all built on such a wobbly foundation because I didn't have good systematic lead gen. I didn't have good margins and and everything just like it just sucked. It sucked so much. And I made so little money and I hated my work and it kind of crumbled down until I downscaled to myself and then rescaled. What was the transition like for because you mentioned that you went from being that kind of team of contractors to being like this proper kind of restructured agency. But I'm curious, like if you if we look at these phases, so if we start out with this staff augmentation or freelancer with a couple big ongoing projects, which it sounds like that was your first step with yeah. those initial clients from the networking event, like what was the again, trying to keep it concise, what was the like transition from that into the like the proper agency agency? Was it just a gradual thing of trying to get as many projects as you could or, or what did that transition look like? No, so the so before I had, when it was me and independent contractors, it was actually really straightforward because I was billing by the hour. I had an arrangement with the, all these contractors where I paid them 70 an hour. I was billing 135 an hour. So it was very clear cut, like very much like, you know, if, if the client disappears, they disappear because mm -hmm. I, they're only getting there. Yeah. I'm the middleman basically. Yep. Um, with the, the whale client we had, they remained a client, but they scaled back dramatically. And that's when I made that shift. Cause I thought I wanted to keep doing this, but more kind of officially, I wanted to be able to say, meet, let's meet, meet in my office kind of thing, rather than just like, yeah, because the issue was when you have independent contractors who are on a project basis, if a new client comes to you, it's hard to commit on the spot without going and recruiting the talent who's going to fulfill it. So I wanted to be able to kind of effectively own the availability of the people that I'm going to be, you know, getting to do the projects with me. Um, so when that whale client kind of scaled back dramatically, that's when that transition happened. And it was it was very risky because I now had fixed expenses. I had a an office. I brought on the salesperson before I really had anyone. So it was a salesperson, me at first, right? Um, and then we slowly started to hire from there. And it was still kind of one of these things where that's where I had to really get serious because it, it was it was never a big deal with the, when we it was just the big whale client and a bunch of us independent people because we would occasionally get like random referrals. It was very occasional, but we could we could fulfill them and we could just scale up and down as need be. And it was just a mathematical equation. Yeah. But when I had fixed overhead, if I don't get a client this month, I still need to pay payroll, right? So it became, I had to really get serious about like ensuring that we had a pipeline of work. And that's why I started to invest in like, join a group called Vistage International, which was like a mastermind kind of community type thing that was local. Um, learned as much as I could from people who were running legitimate businesses who, you know, there's not much different between difference between like say a web agency and like a law firm in the sense that like they both have clients who are paying them and yeah you, know, you, you still need to pay your your paralegals and stuff so the thing that strikes me so it's almost like you bounced from what is like this phase two of staff augmentation which you kind of did as like a hybrid agency approach and then did what so many of us do where you you kind of prematurely jump too many phases over and you went straight up to being this like smaller, medium-sized agency with all these fixed expenses. And I think, at least for me, if I were to go back and do it again, probably I would make it a huge, 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 huge priority 
-hmm. that before I add any real fixed expenses, I would like have, I would own my lead flow and I would have yeah. consistent lead flow coming in as a soloist with maybe a couple of VAs and turn away like 90% of the people who reach out such that if I want to layer on all these fixed expenses, all it means is that I have to say yes to these leads yeah. who I'm saying no to. Oh, what, um, is that, yeah. is that basically what you would do? Yeah, as vanity well? ought to me. I wanted, I wanted an office. I wanted to be able to say, like, <laughs> I have an office. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it, I mean, there were a lot of mistakes. I mean, there was that, there was the fact that all of our money was transactional. We didn't have any recurring revenue. Um, we didn't really have a productized thing. It was more custom proposals for every client. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot I would do in retrospect that would be different. And your transition, once you moved out of the agency was essentially, so I kind of split for phase seven into service and products with hybrid approaches in the middle. So you essentially went from running the agency to, I'm trying to remember the sequence. Was it agency to plan to scope? And then, yeah. so that was a, a software product. And then yeah. I believe- Which I you, built while I was still at the agency because we had enough, I had people paying my bills, right? And we had enough deal flow at that point that I could sit, because I was, I was a coder still, that's my roots. I could sit in my quarter office and build up plan scope. And- the thing that um that I find interesting, so like sometimes, so I, I was talking with Jesse Hanley, and yeah. I know you're bros with Jesse because you introduced me to Jesse. So, yeah. uh, so I was talking to Jesse about his uh, his kind of transition from being a freelancer to running an agency to running Bento. Which for anyone listening, by the time you hear this, well, actually this will be the first podcast episode, but the Jesse episode will either have come out already or it'll come out soon, depending on when you're listening to this. But it's another podcast episode. So when I was talking to Jesse. The thing I found kind of cool about his flow is that he built Bento for for essentially the same customers he served at the agency. But in your case, that's not what happened. And you built PlanScope for other agencies like you. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, again, every agency without fail ends up building either a project management tool, an invoicing tool, a time tracking tool, or a content management system without fail. <laughs> I did the project <laughs> management tool. <laughs> so. It's funny because I actually, there's a an eight-figure agency owner who I'm going to interview in the series, and he just today told me, by the way, Zach, we have a time tracking tool and we can give a deal to DIY people. So I thought that was, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of yeah. funny to hear that. I wonder if this is true. Because we, we, we all end up hitting the tooling that we're stuck with. So we want to yeah. go around. Yeah. And so then you basically, and this, again, listeners, we... I think we all think this is really interesting about Brennan, but for today, I want to try to focus on the agency part because that's probably maybe your immediate step or maybe not. So we'll talk a bit about products because I think, Brennan, you know better than me because you've been running DYF longer than me. Like I would guess that in the DYF audience, probably over 50%, maybe like even over 60 or 70% would prefer to transition out of freelancing or agency work and into products eventually, whether those mm -hmm. products are software products or educational products. What would your guess be about the percentage of the audience? 80, 90%. I mean, okay. I think every a, a lot of people see client work as a means to an end. And so, it's good because it, it gets you grounded in, in kind of direct sales, which um, is going to help when you get into products. So then let's, given that percentage, I'm not really that worried about people thinking this is boring or irrelevant. So let's mark your little flow here. So you're doing this agency and it was going well. You're putting 800K a year in your pocket. Then you switched from that into SaaS. So I'll mark that here. So you built PlanScope as a SaaS. And you basically, as I understand about your story, you started doing content marketing to promote PlanScope. But then your content marketing, which eventually became W Freelancing, was doing better than PlanScope. And so you kind of you sold PlanScope and leaned into DYF. Is that essentially correct? That's right. I mean, um, PlanScope never made more than 5,000 a month in MRR. So it never was a run runaway success. What did well though, was the content marketing I was doing to try to get PlanScope customers was instead of getting people saying, Hey, I want to sign up for PlanScope. They were saying, Hey, can I get more info on like this thing you were talking about in this blog post about pricing? <laughs> so that led to, um, that was enjoying it too. Cause uh, you know, the issue was when you were like me and kind of doing, I was doing content marketing, customer support, product development, product design. Yeah, uh, all of that, right? Um, jumping from the mindset of like, fix a plan scope bug to finish that article. 
was kind of taxing. The beauty of like info products or digital courses or whatever they're called these days um, is they don't really get bugs. <laughs> Software gets bugs. And you're, my the PDF I was selling called W Freelancing Rate didn't really get bugs. Yeah, I've come to appreciate, like I used to really romanticize running a SaaS business because there's, I think, some part of my personality. I have this desire to build the perfect, the perfect system. And I have this, it manifests with dev and it manifests with DYF too. Like my vision for DYF is make, make the tree of courses to take any freelancer from beginner to dream business. And I want to like inject all the necessary quote functions to do the processing to get people the resultant knowledge to keep flowing down this like this grand system. What I've come to appreciate, I used to romanticize the idea with dev that I could like just build the perfect app and then I could just walk away. But I've come to appreciate that just if you run a SaaS, your whole freaking life is just squashing bugs and doing feature requests. That's just your whole life. That doesn't sound actually that fun at all. I hate that. I hate You're squashing bugs. You're talking to bugs. a guy who, uh, who, who now intentionally got yeah, back in the SaaS. Yeah. By the way, enjoy right message, full-time dev. Well, <laughs> I'm, back then I was trying to juggle too many different things. This time I'm doing what I think is the smart thing and going to yeah. hire. Yeah. And I, I, oh, and you said hiring. Yeah, because I know you're um, you're working on finding. We spoke. You were trying to find a PHP dev for uh, for the Cretan cell thing. You're hiring for Right Message as well. Well, the good thing is now that Right Message is under the same parent company as Create and Cell, um, it's the same business. So the back end of Right Message is Laravel, which is PHP. Mm, so cool. technically speaking, and Laura, my wife's plugin, uh, WordPress plugin business is WordPress, which is PHP. So we're kind of hoping for a bit of a unicorn who can um, help out initially with, you know, the various bits and pieces on on WordPress uh, with her plugin, along with my stuff. Um, but we're, I'm not sure if if, in, if that'll actually happen. So the, the main concern is just a developer who will just own right messages code base. Yeah, and something that we can cut from the interview if you don't feel that you publicly resonate with it. But I would say that you probably self-identify with like being prone to shiny objects. Do you publicly mm. self-identify with this? Oh, yeah, I okay. do. And, and that's so something thing, I'm trying to really tone back on. And I think what, I, what, I, what I'll be really curious about as we audit your path, uh, I'll be really curious about like the times when you switched, where you feel in hindsight that that was a shiny object, maybe you would have been better served by staying. Or the times when you switch and you're like, you know, that was a good call. Because yeah. what is cool and what I think is kind of the, the core thing I want people in this course to be thinking about is that if somebody goes through this course and they kind of identify what they think, you know, you don't have to make some set in stone commandment decision of what your dream business is. But if you have a hunch of what you're working towards, I like to reverse engineer that and ask myself, what kinds of business skills or what kinds of technical skills or, or whatever, what kinds of skills do I need to build? to become the type of person who can be successful there. And what I think is kind of cool here is when you think about how right now you're trying to hire a dev for write message and create and sell and stuff, like I think Laura's got a really cool hook with the non-tech founders podcast and stuff. But I also know that Laura's lack of tech skills have been challenging for her sometimes and rewarding other times. But I bet all of your experience running the agency is going to be a huge boon for you as you're trying to hire a dev for your SaaS now. And if you hadn't had that ag agency experience, you might not have such an easy time hiring a dev. Oh, absolutely. I mean, an agency is a business. So, you know, if, if you do, do decide to go down that path, you're going to develop a lot of soft skills on uh, recruiting and managing and all that good stuff that, yeah, I mean, it was definitely, I wouldn't trade in my agency years. Um, I wouldn't trade in my plan scope years. I now have an experience selling a SaaS. Granted, it was a smaller SaaS, but at least I know what that was like. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that informed even how you worked with me in DYF and things like that yeah, because of yeah, exactly. the situation yeah. with PlanScope. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so your flow. So you went from agency to PlanScope and you started PlanScope while you're at the agency, which I want to dig into. And then PlanScope to DYF. And then was it DYF to write message? Was that the next flow? Yes. It was DYF to write message. So and we then write, for write message. Yep. And then write message to like, simul well, I guess write message to create and sell, but you're still in write message. But yeah, there's like this oh. right message. Palladio create and sell is your current sphere. Right? To be honest, there was a bit of a, um, a creative gap, if you will, with right message, where we just weren't growing. My co-founder at the time and I were 
bit deflated about the whole thing. And I needed to get my creative energies out somewhere. So I ended up creating Create and Sell as a way, the way I rationalized it was it's the exact same audience as Write Message. So I justified it to myself as being no one trusts a company blog, but they might trust me. So if they're reading me talking about all things email marketing and personalization and segmentation, well, I happen to have a product that's that focuses on personalization, but it's a bit different than if you were reading like the right message blog, right? Um, so I did it for that reason. And at that same time is when I was approached about the book deal. And in, in hindsight, it looks like it was planned. It looks like, okay, Brennan's got the software business that relates directly to the newsletter thought leader business, which re relates directly to the book thing. And this, they all kind of play nicely with each other's how it looks like, but it wasn't planned. I mean, I, I did write message because frankly, because, um, CEO of Teachable at the time gave me a, called me up and said, Hey, um, we want what you're doing with like custom JavaScript. Can you make it a product? I will, I'll give you money to do that. Um, and we ended up raising money to build it out. We ended up building kind of the wrong product and burned through a lot of the money we raised, which is fine because then we had to operate more as bootstrappers. But then we just kind of got stuck in this bit of a rut and, and I ended up thinking, well, I could just keep doing the content marketing thing like I did for W Freelancing for Right Message, but it really wasn't working. With Right Message or W Freelancing, I was writing content about freelancing and pricing and projects and all that stuff. And it was getting decent good Google traffic. Never really cracked that nut with the right message with our blog. But the create and sell list is growing hundreds of people a day. So that's been working well. And now I'm now that I'm the owner of right message and I can kind of merge the two in a way I haven't been able to historically, I'm now thinking, okay, create and sell is the lead generation arm for right message. It's to prepare people to be ready for right message because right message is a bit of an intimidating product um, by design. So create and sell yeah. is kind of conditioning. And I have a client, a millennial money man who had a similar structure. So he has this business, millennial money man, which is like a really high traffic SEO blog. And it's like the top of funnel for his other business, which he has a business partner for called Laptop Empires, where they have like a Facebook side hustle kind of course. And so mm -hmm. there's this one entity that's responsible for like lead gen that flows into another entity, but he he still owns his marketing channel that's like built or was built around a personal brand, not so much anymore, um, but it flows into the other business as well. But the thing that I think that you've done really well that that I saw in the Jesse interview as well is you you've always you've come at things saying, how can I solve problems? And all of this to my knowledge, all of this, all this email marketing personalization stuff that has become your thing. It's like what you do your keynote speeches about. It's what right message is all about. It's what the audio is pretty much about. Like this whole thing that's become your thing, it was developed because you needed it yourself. Like, yeah. wasn't it you're just like hacking away in DYF that kind of were, what was, was the seeds of this that came into its own product? Is that right? Yeah, it was custom JavaScript. I was like, oh, there's different types of freelancers. Wouldn't it be cool to show like yeah. copywriter testimonials on a sales page with their copywriter? How do I do that? And yeah. I think that's the that's the big thing that I think is so important to remember is that like it's it's like you were talking about with um what sorry, now I'm forgetting her name, that woman earlier who uh is doing those reverse engineering oh, Chanel. thingies. Yeah, Chanel. Uh if you look at somebody's end state. It's easy to think that they made some intentional, like Brennan one day, 10 years ago said, I'm going to be the email personalization guy. And yeah, then yeah. he just did that. But it's yeah. it's like there's this through line that you can see if you backtrack his whole story and that that informed everything that he did and, and that he just kind of kept leaning into that with a couple of fundamental things, which is like always be educating, building authority, helping and building like building kind of a brand around this education versus just being a keyboard person, a person who can yeah. do a job for hire. So let's dig in a little bit to um, like this, the whole, is this structure right for you section? Like I'd love to basically compare, compare the experiences you've had in these different sorts of businesses 
and the kind of day in the life and stuff. So before we get into that, let's ask you some of the like kind of so I'm going to ask like pros and cons kinds of questions that I want to establish that that fundamental resonance of like if someone's listening and they want to know if they resonate with your priorities and outlook and stuff, I want to ask some questions for that. So if you're listening, this will kind of loosely follow our dreamscaping worksheet. So if you have filled that out, pull it up. If you haven't, you can download that at dyf.link forward slash dreamscaping, which in hindsight maybe is difficult to spell, but it's the word dream. <laughs> And then scaping. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Brennan, at this point in your life, how would you, with with no not a lot of guidance from me, but like, how would you define the ideal business for your specific preferences? Like, what characterizes the ideal business to you? Yeah. So I think um, if you would have asked me this a year ago, I would have said no staff because i think i'm still it was always still me I, I had an issue i didn't really mention this yet but back when i was running the agency i would go to conferences out you know travel to conferences travel to meet clients and do the rounds as i thought of it and um there was a bit of resentment that built up between my team and i where they were thinking why is brennan off going to these cool events and gallivanting you know, yeah gallivanting around and i couldn't i i i it, it frustrated me so much because i was like don't you get where clients come from like don't you get the equation but a lot of them didn't to be honest a lot of them kind of saw me never being in the office and my argument was well the clients are in the office the clients are out there right so um i i kind of i always like hated the fact that i kind of built up this this nine to five for myself where I felt like if I wasn't physically in the office 40 hours a week, people were pissed at me and I didn't like that. So I kind of always like was like, oh, I don't want to do that again. So I'm not, I'm not going to hire. So I think if I were to reverse analyze my own decisions, all my fears of recruitment centered around that worry. But I think a lot of that could have been fixed if I just set the right expectations and made it clear why I was doing certain things. Yeah, that was that was my thought too is like, it kind of almost just highlights a lack of foundational business education to the yeah. staff. Yeah, yeah. I didn't make that clear, and that's my fault. So I think like it was actually really freeing now because now um, I have really the first proper hire I've had. I mean, we, we did hire originally with Right Message, but that was, again, with other people's money, right? So we raised 600000 So it's like, what do you do? You, you use it on paying people for stuff. Um, <laughs> but the... Uh, now I've hired somebody out of out of our own cash flow, who's my full time executive assistant, and it's been really nice knowing that I went away to Greece last week and I came back to a tackled inbox, which is totally new for me because I always stress I I hated going away on vacation because I was like I'm going to get back and just a mountain of stuff. Um, so I think for for me the perfect business would be one in which I have minimal meetings, minimal commitments, a lot of deep work. If I do have commitments and meetings, it's kind of batched up, but a lot of deep work because I love building. I love creating stuff. I'm still kind of in that. I was talking to my wife the last night about this. I still kind of have that that perspective on business like it's a giant video game where I want to do the the really fun quests that give a lot of experience points, um, aka money. All right. So I uh, I really do enjoy enjoy that. I like having a tight feedback loop with with customers. I like knowing that even though this means getting a little more involved than I think some people would say I should be doing, um, being able to hear directly from people about like successes or even complaints or whatever else. So basically being an active part of customer support effectively. I enjoy that. Um, and I really like, you know, it, you know, it was always nice with the agency stuff when we would sign like a hundred thousand dollar project because you could be like, you know, pop up in the champagne, let's go out to dinner kind of thing, right? It's not as exciting now because it's like, oh, I got a few more $79 a month customers today. Cool. But, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it, it doesn't feel the same, but it's nice knowing that I'm starting every month with knowledge that I have this many people who are going to be paying me this month. Yeah, some I cancel, but for the most part, they're not all going to cancel. Um, so it just becomes a giant mathematical equation where I'm like, I think I'll get this growth rate. 
I'll probably have this churn rate. And I'll still come out next month better than I started this month or something. Um, so I really enjoy that. I think I, I, li I like the more customers paying me a smaller amount, which means I'm not beholden to any of them like I was in the past. Um, infrastructure where I've got um, a group of people who I know and like who are helping in a lot of ways, um, kind of run the ships, um, where we're all mutually benefited from that. And um, yeah, just being able to, I mean, it, it sounds it sounds trite, but the whole like make an impact. I'm not trying to make a global impact. I'm not doing a Elon Musk and moving to everyone to Mars impact, but I'm thinking I'm doing enough stuff that I've 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 received enough emails from customers without prompt that say, you don't know me, you've never talked to me, but you've materially changed my life in this way. Here's how that I know that I'm able to go to bed at night thinking like I'm doing something good. I don't think I could do it if I was, you know, a proper like internet marketer scammer type person and made, you know, shit loads of money, but, but everyone hated, I couldn't do that. So, I've got yeah. a question for you on that yeah. one, actually. So yeah. as you know, from our like private CEO types of talks, this community, dyf.link slash dyfa has been kind of an experiment for me to see if I would feel a bit, a bit more like, a bit more like I'm actually helping people than, than I personally do. If I like write a cool blog post, someone makes a comment, they're like, oh, Zach, this was so awesome. It changed my life. It's great. Like, I know it, when that happens, I know it kind of like as a piece of data, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel like anything to me. Does it feel like things to you? Like when you get one of those emails, like, do you feel it? Or oh, is yeah. it, is it less than if you do it in person, like at a DIF event or something, for example? It's good and bad because I think like when I get an email like that, I, I mean, I, I reply and tell them you, you've made my day and, and I'm sincere usually because I don't get that many of them. Right. But I do get enough that my days are made often enough, but then you get the flip side and you get some people who are just like, again, there, there's a, there's a very vocal small minority of people who, um, even if you have all the, the most altruistic intentions will find a way to make you feel like shit. So there's still a degree of that I've, I've got, I've developed a quite a thick skin. And I think, you know, I've talked about this a bit of where I, I realize the problem is probably more with them than me. Um, data just yields that result. <laughs> um, so I don't let it bother me as much as I used to. I used to get really insulted by refund requests and thinking, what did I do wrong? Um, so I don't, I don't let that bother me as much anymore. But yeah, I think like, I mean, obviously, like when I was doing the W Freelancing Conference, it was even better being able to hear you've changed my life with somebody two feet away from you. But even that, you know. so, like, what I'm curious about. So let's say I do a website for a client, a website design yeah. client, and it like impacts their business and it impacts their their, their customers. Like, let's say I really resonate with how they're helping the world and they're like, Zach, this website, it's got me all these new clients and I'm helping all these people. And these guys built like a house for a charity. And, uh, it still doesn't, it doesn't like, I'm like, oh, that's cool. But it doesn't like make me feel so warm and fuzzy as if it were direct, but you're saying for you, it would, because the reason I'm asking this is like for the person listening, I want to see if like where they fall on the spectrum and what they resonate yeah. with you or, or not to help inform their choices. I mean, I think like, well, that's interesting that you say that. Cause I think like when I, the more I think about it, you know, we talked about the create and sell thing and being a creative outlet for me. I found that when I write and do my newsletter pontificating with create and sell, the replies I get tend to be more, you've materially transformed me in some way, shape or form. Whereas I don't think I've ever, I, I know for a fact, cause I have the data and the analytics that like with the right message, I've done that for customers, uh, by virtue of building a tool that on their dashboard says they're, they've increased sales by 80%. Cool. But they're not emailing me saying you've, you've, you've done whatever. And I think it's mm -hmm. cause you know, it's a difference of like a guide versus a tool vendor, right? <laughs> like yeah. I'm a tool vendor here. No one ever credits like the uh the the dewalt uh, yeah for the house they built know, for the or the like tree house that their kid like yeah went crazy about right yeah um but they might credit the person who did the youtube video yeah 
talking about how to build a treehouse or something, right? So or like their neighbor theme. who was like, yo, you should really build that treehouse. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's the, um, I think that's one of the reasons why I really like still having the newsletter. Cause I have a lot of friends in the SaaS world who are very behind the scenes. They don't, they, they hire people to do all their email marketing. They hire all the content marketing out. They, they're just, there, like, you know, behind the curtain kind of thing of, um, you know, wizard boss style, right? Like they're not, there's no face. And I think I, I personally in the sort who I, what propels me more than revenue is getting that kind of response. Like I, I send a newsletter, I, I'm, I'm addicted to my inbox. I hate to say it, but like for the next hour or two, hoping that people reply and saying, <laughs> I really like this. Thank you. <laughs> sounds stupid, but you know, I, I still do to this day do that. Um, and yeah, so I think, um, I think that's one of the reasons why I still like having this, this other outlet, like create and sell. I, I get a different kind of response than I do as the tool vendor with the right message. So as I think through your definition of the ideal business for the specific preferences, I can definitely see somewhere like it, it kind of sticks out as the agency, not being a good fit for some of these. One thing that I've come to appreciate is that like, for me, when I was working as a highly leveraged freelancer, like a soloist, or as a small agency, there are certain things that I never got to appreciate how fun they could be because I kept the business so small. I think about it a lot, how like that whole business as a video game thing, you don't get to really experience that as a soloist because if you do all this awesome marketing and personalization, like have a really cool funnel, at the end of the day, you're still, you're still just creating more work for yourself to fulfill projects. And yeah. even if you're like really leveraged into productized stuff that you're still personally fulfilling, like you, you're still just creating a job for yourself. And I think that that's where I currently butt into the challenges. Whereas if it's a more product-based business, the fulfillment is more driven by systems or code or whatever yeah. that, uh, that allow you to spend more time on the video game stuff and less time on the like slaying boars in the forest <laughs> the grinding, directly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm kind of curious, like, cause again, if the, the hook of this is kind of Brennan running a scaled agency and then that compared to why you think products are a better fit for you, uh, I'm, I know that your work mentality now is much different than it was in 2011. So I'm kind of curious now on this spectrum or of these options, which you resonate with. And I'm also curious which you resonated with when you were running the agency. So one of them could be like lifestyle business. Another one would be like hustle now so that I can relax later. Or another one's yeah. like, I love work and I'll always want to work. So I just want to find something that like fuels me that I could stick to forever or like work is life. Which of these resonate now versus then? Well, back then it was very much like I really, weirdly, I was one of those kids who was like romanticized the idea of like business travel. <laughs> like, you know, you're, you're at the airport and you see like the person in a suit uh, with the briefcase going to some exotic place. Like I always thought that was kind of cool. Um, and it was funny, like my wife, my wife and I were talking about this a while back and she was like, I never saw many women doing that. So I never like I, you obviously as a white guy could have, could have like done that. And that she was trying to really make a compelling reason for why it's different for both minorities and, and women. Um, because they didn't probably see as much as that as, as I did. Right. Anyway, I always thought that was really exciting. I love the idea of like international travel. I mean, I would do anything to like get the client in Germany or Japan or whatever else, right? I decided more of an excuse to say, I've got a client in Japan, uh, you know, and like, I got, I was waiting to be able to recruit uh, an employee, say in London and be able to say, I have a London office. Like that was, all, that was kind of my, my thing then, right? Um, and... I think these days though, um, I mean, it, I still get the, I get, I still have and see the, the allure of that, but I absolutely at this point am more thinking, how do I maximize impact by, while also minimizing involvement, if that makes sense. Like I, I don't want to be, I like knowing that right now today in 2023, I have systems in place that are making me money for work that I did a while ago. Um, 
which I never had back then. It was all very much, like I mentioned, transactional. So I think there is though, like you said a second ago, how it's like, it, it kind of, it almost seemed like an either or kind of setup, right? Like you either are, have this like selling time thing where you can't really scale effectively and you're always kind of a giant dependency or you're like living the like SaaS digital creator life thing. <laughs> But I would argue that there's a friend, my friend Nick Desbato runs a company called Draft. And he did something that I always thought was really interesting is he did a thing which is a kind of like monthly A-B testing as a service, right? This is back before productized was talked about like it is these days. And what he did was he originally fulfilled it all himself where he would say every month I'm going to run experiments and then we're going to give you a CEO ready report at the end of the month. That tells you exactly what we tested, what worked, what didn't work, what we're planning next month. And over time, he developed internal software and recruited more kind of juniors to do the experimentation and the reporting and all that stuff. And he would just kind of give his approval stamp at the end. So he he kind of used his own human capital, his labor initially, but then recruited either other people or other machines to substitute it while still maintaining the same output, same delivery. Yeah. And what was cool about that is he started to learn how to like sell his time as a product, which is so invaluable for when, when and if you do get into products, knowing how to sell a product where you're not, you don't have the back and forth dialogue. You need to be able to write a compelling sales page and having a compelling sales and marketing funnel that gets people in front of that product to buy. Like by doing what Nick did, that equipped him with the skill set to do that. And I always think like, if you do want to get into products, I think the best bet is if you're a freelancer today and you want to get to products would be the productized route, learning how to sell, not sell conversationally, but selling through a, a monologue, a sales page, and then fulfilling predictably and stuff. And then yeah. finding ways to automate. And again, all these no code things make this a lot easier these days, but like, removing yourself from the equation until totally. you could build an A-B testing platform. Boom. Yeah. There you go. And you got the audience right because you've been, you've been building up that that portfolio of clients for for years. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, I've often been thinking that if I were to go back and like create an agency as an experiment to like it build good content for DYF, it would definitely be that productized kind of direction because that's a way that you can actually build real business skills as like a service provider, whereas the like the leveraged freelancer route that I took kind of I, I had this comfortable cushion, but it was at the cost of building valuable skills for growing an actual business. Yeah. And by honing that service offering and having something more productized, totally. I'm with you. So a question that I have is um with this structure, because where I've always personally struggled is that if I'm doing something like that draft, like a productized service where it is predictably fulfilled, I feel a lot more comfortable delegating that kind of work because you're delegating the execution of an SOP. And mm -hmm. I, I feel quite comfortable making an SOP. But when running a bespoke agency, the, the thing that I always bet against that I found really difficult was that it relied on finding skilled humans. And that, at least for my agency, that was such a big part of it. So. When we're thinking about when you were running that bespoke agency, yeah. the next question I have down is, and, and let's, let's again, root it in, you're putting 800K a year in your pocket. Like you're doing well financially, things are going well, you've got good staff, and they seemed good. On this following one to 10 scale, with one being you enjoyed this business you know, enough, but it was mostly a way to pay the bills until you could get into the type of business you really wanted to do. Versus a 10 being, you really love this business and would stay for forever, which we obviously know it wasn't. Otherwise, you wouldn't have left. Like, where did it fall on the spectrum for you? And what what drove the transition out of running a, by all accounts, successful agency into Planscope? Like you said, you got bit by the Amy Hoy bug, the yeah. 30 by 500 bug. Like, what exactly, you you mentioned all of your work priorities. So like, which of these these things was this successful agency not giving you? What What pulled you away? I think it was, remember that issue I talked about a moment ago with the employee issue. I think it was just realizing that I had created a nine to five that was paying well, 
but a, a proper nine to five where I commuted to an office that was my own office every day. Mm. Um, and I didn't see really a path out of that. So I think that was, that was my big thing was feeling, uh, you know, kind of golden handcuffs, I guess is probably a good way of putting it. So when you're looking back, like supposing that, like, let's say you hired some consultant and they came in and they essentially gave your staff business education such that the staff, they understood the importance of you doing those conferences and, and the staff was like super stoked for you to go to conferences. Yeah. And they were like, Brennan, why are you even in the office, dude? You need to be out, like putting your face in the world. Yeah. What, what then would you, would you have loved the business everything. or what? Could have, I mean, I've got a friend who started an agency at about the same time as me in the same town. It's called Grow Interactive. He still runs it. He's got 80, 90 employees at this point. Um, he just bought a sc proper skyscraper in town that he's now the landlord of and like making it this really swank co working slash community center type thing. It could have been different. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think ultimately though, I would have always like the whole idea of passive was always something that I really wanted. So that would have got me eventually, I think not passive in the sense that you just magically make money, but like passive in the sense that like past work yields present future, uh, yeah, like building for, him, assets. For, for Drew still, that's still true. I mean, he's at the point now where he has sales team and he's got like, he could go on a sabbatical for a year and probably things would mostly hum along. And I don't know the dynamic between him and his team, but probably better than the way it was between me and my team. Um, so, but yeah, I just, I never got that. And I, I, I kind of escaped through products um, out of my own hole. So do you think if you look at your values that you listed earlier, like, are there any of those that stick out to you as like, if someone's listening and they're thinking they're wanting to go down this bespoke agency route and they're wondering if there are incompatibilities for them with it, because it is always hard to tease out, like if something is a fundamental incompatibility with your personality, or yeah. if it's just a roadblock that could have been worked around like this staff one. Um, when you look at your values and you look at what it's like running a product-based business, like DIF, right message, create and sell, whatever, versus running that agency. Uh, do you see any things that, that are your values that would have been, regardless of how much problem solving you did, fundamental incompatibilities? Or do you think that with the right problem solving, you could be happy doing that still right now? Well, funny, funny you mentioned that. I'm actually now, I haven't really announced this yet, but I'm building an agency. I'm building an agency on top of right message because our biggest roadblock has always been implementation. And for me to get the kind of cl caliber of clients I want, we need to do that. So mm -hmm. I'm not a, I'm not by any means. I think I I think I've come to accept that the thing that led me to exit the agency before was not an issue of agencies. <laughs> it was an issue of feeling trapped. And I think like what I'm doing now is I'm building this thing from day one, where I'm not a dependency because I'm still the CEO. Of right message. I'm bringing on a guy, just talked to him earlier today, who's basically going to be running the agency arm of the business. I'm teach I'm telling him what to do. I'm teaching him what to do. We're collaborating on, on all that stuff early on. I'll be more involved. But yeah, I mean, because I, I realize it's it's a it's a need. And you see this also like just the other day, Nathan Berry and, and Sal Hill Bloom, um, and and Shane, I forgot his last name, but they launched an email newsletter agency. And here's Nathan who runs a two, he owns a two hundred million dollar email marketing platform. What's he doing starting an agency? Um, I, I think first off, agencies can make a serious money, like really, especially if you dial in the productization stuff right. Um, I forgot the there was an interview on my first million. I forgot the exact episode. Actually, I think it might have been with like I, I don't look up to the guy too much. So they don't hold this against me, but he was interviewing Neil Patel, and the money that they purport to make with Neil Patel's agency is like ridiculous um and yeah i mean they've got you when you when you when you think in terms of systems and processes and sops and productization and stuff you can make really good money if you're just a, if you're a sweatshop of of labor yeah i mean it's gonna be a bit difficult but that's where you usually start right like with me i always held the keys that we did road mapping 
mostly because you mentioned about the fear of like, how do you, I always worry that I'm going to sell a good thing to a client. So I'm going to do the whole like sales and then throw them over the wall to like, say, Andrew, who's going to like be the, the lead on their project. And then Andrew's going to screw it up and the blowback and stuff. So that's why I did all the road mapping myself. I, I did all the sales. I did all the road mapping. The road mapping was my way of capturing the business problem and turning it into technical solutions. And then the technical solutions I knew that they could do. But I wasn't always confident that everyone on my team could say, here's our fuzzy business problem. What do we need to do technically to solve it? That's, that, that's what I did. Um, and then the team that I recruited did the, you know, the login form or the password reset or any of that right. stuff that's kind of lower risk. That makes sense. And I love what you're saying about the, um, the approach you're taking now with right message and stuff like, um, a concept that, that I got from the interview with Jesse that kind of speaks to what you're describing here is like almost this idea of servicitized products. You know, we talk about productized services all the time, yeah. but Jesse was talking about how with his first bento customers, he did just what you're describing for right message. Like he did yeah. the bento agency to yeah. get them configured and stuff. And it, it exposed bugs and features that needed to be built. Like it was that really intense one-on-one -on -one feedback that you get from working with a client that you don't get when someone buys your thing is 100% silent and cancels two months later with no yeah. indication yeah. about why they did that. Yeah. Um, and what I also love about what I'm hearing is like this, this idea that there's no finite endpoint and no finite one directional line. And that as you go forward and you build business skills, you're able to kind of loop back and cycle and everything's different because now mm -hmm you are a different person like the, yes. the alchemist you've coming back to you where you came new from. Skills, you've realized, you know, that you don't have a people, you don't have an issue with hiring. You don't have an issue with managing. I always thought, again, asked me a year or two ago, I would have said, I just don't have what it takes to manage people. I hate managing people. Now I've come to realize I never learned that skill. I went into managing people without ever being trained to manage people. Yeah. Now I've done my homework and now I think I can do a decent job. Yeah, I've I've even reflected on that here, like working with Mari, the VA and video editor, which hello, Mari, as you edit this uh, with DYF has just been a joy. It's been so smooth, but I've also created really good structures and really good SOPs that back when I was running my agency and managing people, I kept hearing everyone saying you're supposed to do this, but I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Whereas now I think my memory has like declined with age. Like I probably have early onset almost Alzheimer's. So I've just gotten good at doing these things for myself because I know that future Zach will have no idea what the hell <laughs> he's supposed to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then but then these skills you cycle back and then things become easier that were once these insurmountable roadblocks. So I'd like to hear from you about if you if you reflect on the things, the things that like regardless of whether someone's going to start an agency or a product-based business or some hybrid, because really the hybrid seems like the ultimate hack. Mm -hmm. If you can sort of leverage all of the marketing work you're doing for an agency to be the springboard to build a product-based business on or vice versa, be, be an agent. Yeah. Vice versa, or be an agency that offers a product. Like Neil Patel is kind of like the epitome almost, if you think about him of like this blueprint thing in action, because Neil Patel has this gigantic, like I think eight figure agency is Neil Patel's agency and he has his various products and it's all being driven from his like blog and stuff like that's, that's this exact hybridized thing that we're yeah. talking about. And I don't know Neil Patel's business that much, but besides like the whole own your lead flow blueprint stuff, which I would think we agree is pretty dang foundational for running a solid business. What are the things that you think if you're thinking about you know, someone's listening, they want to grow a bespoke agency, or they're listening and they want to do a product or some hybrid. What are the things that stick out to you as like the really, really game changer skills that, that someone would need to build to be successful? Like what are the things that caused the problems back then? Like you talk about the hiring issues. Now you're better about yeah. hiring and management stuff. What are the game changer skills that you've built along the way that are a huge boon to your success? I think the big thing, okay. So a few things. So there's the the internal stuff like the hiring and managing stuff, which again, I'm, I'm, I'm still not perfect at it. So I'm not going to talk too much about how to do it, but there are plenty of good people who have written books and stuff on that. Um, I think a big thing for me has been, one was the realization that no one ever hired us for code. Um, and really internalizing that and, and really 
figuring out that that meant we had to kind of change our approach, change everything and realize that there was like, there was a business reason that clients were paying us lots of money. That's one thing. The other thing I think was the realization this kind of started with the whole network we had built up locally that we could actually create customers. So I was always of the opinion that people, a client would say, okay, I need a new web app built and they're going to scope it out and figure out what needs to be done and then come to us. I never thought, well, can we convince somebody that they need a web app to be built? You know, like that was never, I never thought that was my role. I always thought I was an order taker. Um, so I think that was a big thing when we started to think, how do we use this audience to at scale, not one-on-one, but like one to many, um, convince people of the merits of custom software development and how it could be, how it could work for them. That was a big thing because that, that, that affected everything that affects what I do this day, you know, today people like with the right message, people don't know they need personalization software. I need to convince them that they are missing out by not personalizing. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that's even, even with, um, I mean, largely W freelancing, like a lot of the original kind of SEO bait articles were trying to meet people where they are today. Like what are, what do I need to do to start freelancing? And then convince them of the problems of like commoditized freelancing and all that kind of stuff. Most people didn't know going into it what value pricing was or how to think about themselves as like a business solutions consultant, as tacky as that sounds. But I had to, you know, help them do that. So I think a big thing that a big realization has been, I think this comes from the employee mindset of like you're you're at a you're in a cubicle at a job, you wait for boss to tell you what to do right um to this mindset of i have a lot of skills i have a lot of experience and my clients don't have it all figured out as much as i think that they might um so there's a lot of people out there i could benefit what can i do to meet them where they are today and chauffeur them to where they need to be to be a great customer of mine another question i'm going to try to rapid fire these so we can do some q a before we go if we're thinking about running a bespoke agency like you had, what do you um, what do you like about a bespoke agency relative to a product based business, and what do you what do you like better about a product based business? Um, the more immediate cash flow is nice because you don't really need a you don't need to R and D a product like the right message. I need to build a SaaS. I could become a agency tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lower startup cost. Yeah. Um, I also think like the trajectory of, let's say you want to be averaging 10,000 a month in, re in revenue, recurring revenue. Say you have a package that's five grand a month. Getting two customers is going to be a lot easier than getting 50 or people paying 50 a month times 200 or whatever, whatever that would be. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so obviously a lot quicker. Um, I think there's also the skills you get from actual sales, like like actual direct sales, one on one direct kind of sales, thing. like mm -hmm. talking with people and hearing pushback and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of benefit from from doing that. I think um, that one's. If I can expand on that, I think that's <clears throat> a really really good point. I noticed that a lot of people in the audience have like, and I can relate to this too, like this kind of preference, especially when doing something like a Trojan horse interview or whatever, there's this inclination, like, I'm just going to send them a Google form. They fill it out. I just sit here and hide. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, I'm just yeah. going to build a landing page and either they buy it or they don't. But then you miss out on all that data that even though it's scary to have the conversations and it's scary to be rejected in sales and stuff, you get, you build these skills that then affect the other things. Yeah. I think that's yeah. pretty cool. I mean, honestly, if you want to, if you want to reverse engineer, even the trajectory of one of my best selling course really ever mastering ConvertKit in terms of revenue, W freelancing rate was more volume. Um, the, if you think about how that happened, I did consulting for Gumroad. I did consulting for a bunch of software companies. I learned a lot of stuff that way. And then I started doing it in a kind of a group workshop setting. I did a thing with Nathan Berry for a few times where we would do these kind of like live how to how to go about doing like email marketing and creator stuff the right way. And then eventually 
after enough of that, that led to me having the confidence to say, I've done enough face-to-face -face dialogue about this problem domain that I feel confident to create a course on it. Yeah. Everyone wants to go in the hole or the cave, I should say, and bang out the course and hope it sells. But I think a lot of people miss that you can technically create a course, but it could be the wrong course. Totally. Um, and I think if you, the more live kind of stuff you can do, the better. So honestly, like I would say this to anyone who wants to start a software company, do every, do all this stuff, all the selling live. Like my, my friend, Andrew, who funny enough, he used to work for me at, at Titans. He then created a product called Churnbuster, um, and now runs an app called bullet train. So he's done really well for himself, but he, um, he, when he launched Churnbuster, the only way to sign up for it was you pay him. And then he'd get on a, back then it was Skype, a Skype call with him where he'd ask you to share your screen. He'd say, I just sent you a link, click on it, type in your username and password, get set up. And then he would onboard you live because he didn't build the onboarding yet. He didn't know how to onboard people. So he'd watch people live stumble through getting Churnbuster up and running. And that informed him on how to onboard people. Mm, yeah. So I think there, you can't, so only so much you can get with like open rates, click through rates, Google yeah. Analytics, that kind of stuff. Like it's so important to do this kind of stuff. I've been talking lately in the community about this idea of like scaffolding, which is kind of mm -hmm. what you're talking about here and how it's if you prematurely build scaffolding, whether that scaffolding is a free email course or an opt-in or whatever, or a sales page or a SaaS, <clears throat> if you build that before you've done the process manually a few times to know what the expectations are, you're liable to go build something out in a totally wrong direction. Yes. And I heard the idea somewhere of someone who kind of positioned something as if it was a SaaS, where it's like you'd fill the thing out and then supposedly the software would do it behind the scenes and then they'd send it to you or whatever. And it was like they would manually go through the process and do it as a service and work with the clients. And then eventually, <laughs> once the process was honed, I think it might have been uh, Dan Norris who talked about this. Once the process was honed, that became the product eventually. Well, I just saw this say there, there was a thing on Twitter yesterday I saw about um, somebody who did like, it look, yeah, it looked like a, a a proper software thing. You like pay three hundred dollars and they incorporate a company for you or something. It does all these things, but initially it was just like, yeah, okay, Stripe just paid us three hundred bucks. Okay, got to go to this website, fill out yeah. this form. Go to yeah. that website, fill out this form. Yeah, um, but they've they've obviously automated that at this point. Uh, but it's a great way to start because you don't know if the demand's there. You don't know if yeah, it's a lot easier to do the selling and manual fulfillment than spending a bunch of time coding or building like a, your thing and then realizing, crap, I don't know how to sell it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So a couple more questions for everyone who's here. Uh, we're going to switch to Q&A in a sec. So if you want to start typing your questions into the chat, we'll ask them. So I'm curious, Brennan, if you think about like a scaled bespoke agency, are there any any personality traits or like identifying characteristics that you'd say of like, <clears throat> this type of person should definitely not d go the bespoke agency route. Like, is there any type of person who like, no matter what layers you try to put on, it could just like, you shouldn't do it. Um, so again, that's, that's something that I've changed my opinion on. I would have said like, oh, if you're super introverted, don't because introverts can't sell, but I've met enough people over the years to realize it's not true. And I'm an introvert, but I'm not, I'm not an introvert when it comes to like, if I'm networking, I become an extrovert, but my default is to be an introvert. Um, so I used to think like, cause I, you, you do get this, you get the people who are like, I don't ever want to talk to clients. And it's like, well, if you're going to, if you're going to sell, you kind of need to do that. But I think it's something that can be, can be learned. Um, I'm very, I don't really buy into the whole thing of like, oh, I'm naturally not a people person or something. It's like, well, maybe you're naturally not, but you can learn to be like, you can learn to do it in this way. Um, so I think that would have been something that I used to think, I, I don't really know. Like I, I mean, even things like not, not being skilled, I hate to say it, but like, I think especially with the adoption of like the no code thing, which doesn't really require too many technical skills. You could say like, okay, your problem is you want a way to like have a payment form that after they pay, they go do an intake form and then you send that off to so-and-so. 
Like that would have required custom code back in back in the day. But you could, frankly, like somebody who's not technically skilled could probably build up an agency that did that. That just kind of, yeah. I mean, so I think, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything I would say that like, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. And if someone's listening and they think, all right, yeah, this is cool. I like the idea of going the agency route, or maybe I'll go agency and then go into products or whatever, but I'm going to target the agency. If you look back on your own challenges and stuff, uh, what do you advise as like how they should ease into it or milestones they should achieve first or skills they should achieve first or prerequisites or path they should follow? Like what, what do you think before you do what Brennan did and hire a bunch of people and buy an office? Yeah. Like what should they do first? Own your lead flow. I think if you're, if that's the big thing by owning it, I mean, having a predictable way of getting new clients and mm. ensuring that they turn into Gosh. clients. And I think the easiest way I do that nowadays would be recurring. It's so easy when you have recurring because I kind of treated our client pipeline as recurring revenue where I knew we had enough people always in the pipeline eventually that given our limited ability to like, it'd be great if we could just say, yeah, we've doubled the team this month and we like clear the pipeline quickly. Like we, we couldn't do that. So, um, if we would have done more of a kind of a recurring model, I don't know how mm -hmm. that would have worked given the kind of work we did, but if I could have figured out a way of doing that, um, it would have been a lot easier because then it's very much like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that now. I mean, like right messages, recurring revenue. So I have very, I have milestones that I've set that when I get to this revenue, I'm going to hire somebody new. When I get to this revenue after that, I hire somebody else. It's just a lot simpler then. My guess is it would have needed to be closer to the money. Like, cause when we look back on your agency structure, you were doing like kind of commoditized work. You weren't doing all yeah. the stuff that we're now yeah. teaching. And, no. and that's just it is like, if you wanted to make that work recurring, you'd probably want to do something where you're doing ongoing UX optimization or like on, yeah. but I guess it was internal apps. So maybe auditing time spent on the app at home. Like you'd have to have something that was like indeed providing the ongoing value to not have it each be like a yeah, one and I done mean, that, project. That's, that's exactly it. And, and, and I thought about like, well, could I have done, cause we always finish a project, which could be a one month or a six month project. And then we'd be like, we'd have an offboarding where it's like, okay, so who's going to inherit this? Who's going to run this and stuff. And actually in our latter days of running it, I did, um, I did convince some people to like pay us on retainer, uh, for a set amount of hours every month to like maintain and add stuff. And the problem there is my team always wanted to work on the fun, new greenfield stuff. No one wanted to be like the like maintenance man. Mm -hmm. Right. So didn't really, and it was never meaningful of revenue that, but I think that could have been an option where it's like some sort of like, I don't, I don't know, like do the upfront work, make a bunch of money there, but then also have like, rather than you needing to hire a full time developer, they're expensive. Good luck recruiting when you don't know how to vet people and all that kind of stuff. We can do something where we just maintain it for you. Yeah. And so you mentioned owning lead flow. Do you know of any courses where people can learn how to do that? <laughs> One, I think it's called blue something. Blue, um, blue something. All right. The blueprint. Yeah. So double your freelancing.com slash blueprint. Yeah. So <clears throat> Brendan, before we go, this has been great. Do you have any, um, any parting thoughts or like any questions you think I should have asked you in terms of someone like trying to determine if this agency routes the right, right way to go? I think the the only thing I'd say is that nothing is ever, it's not like to go back to the video game thing. You know, when you start a video game and you need to pick your class, like you're the rogue or the warrior or whatever. I've changed my class many times. <laughs> so you can, you can absolutely try this. You can like, there's no, like you don't need to think, okay, now I'm, I'm an agency owner until I retire. Like, like, uh, I'm I'm doing this agency thing, like I mentioned, with the right message. Will I be doing it a year from now? Who knows? Like, <laughs> I think that's the big thing is it. It you should always push yourself. I find myself. I think one of the reasons I've been re resisting direct sales with right message is because I'm naturally wanting to do the easy thing, which is the how do I just make a really optimized sales page and get people to plug in their card and go. 
which is I think every kind of introverted, introvert inclined, recurring revenue, passive, whatever kind of person like me um, likes. We like waking up and saying, oh, I've never met this person, but they now paid me money into my Stripe account. Cool. Um, but that attitude has been holding me back for this kind of business. So I need to fix that and I need to mm. embrace things I'm not, I'm, I, that, that don't naturally come comfortable to me, like filling up my calendar with sales calls. I think it's great to hear because it's easy. <clears throat> There's this mentor of mine, Brian Johnson from Heroic, that has this thing he says that is, you are never exonerated. This idea mm -hmm. that like you don't, you don't just one day arrive and now you don't have any problems anymore. And I love what you're saying because like, you know, I wouldn't have come into this expecting that Brennan Dunn would be intimidated by sales calls. He's done sales <laughs> calls. Like there are some things that maybe will always be challenging, or some things yeah. that you push through enough that they don't become challenging, but then you go a few years forward and it's been a while since you've done them and now you've lost all your confidence and you get your imposter syndrome and all of this stuff. So I think this well, is really enough, cool Let me clarify one thing. It's not sales calls. It's I'm going to be starting to do outreach, cold mm. outreach, which is new to me. I guess you haven't had to do outreach because you're Brennan freaking done. It's always been inbound. Yeah. And now I'm like the kind of clients that I need that I want for a right message. I want to be able to say, target marketing people at big companies who use HubSpot. So will you be doing Trojan Horse people. interviews for them? No, I'm going to do the whole annoying cold outreach email thing. <laughs> Document it <laughs> as you go there because I, I want to use that in DYF. I want to see how yeah, it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I might eventually. Um, for now, the easiest switch to flip is going to be literally these prospecting tools where you can say target people who use this tech, namely things we integrate with, with like, hey, HubSpot, Plus, personalize your website. You know, that's the subject, and then get them into a demo call that way. Um, but I'm still, it's still a bit fluid. I'm, yeah, I, I will report back with how. Yeah, I will. I will nag you to follow up on this. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Well, thanks so much for being here, uh, and for you guys who are still here. I trust we've answered all your questions, and because they haven't come through. So, Brennan, this is wonderful. Uh, for the people listening, there's not really anything to promote because, I mean, we could promote Brennan's irrelevant right message business if you want, but DYF is still <laughs> Brennan's business. So how about you just go to DYF? We'll promote DYF. Yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, this was this was lovely. It was really nice to pick your brain a bit here. So Brennan and I will stay on for a minute. I'll hit the stop recording button. Everyone who came, thank you guys so much. If you're listening to the recording, we appreciate all of the reviews on the various places that you listen to podcasts and whatnot. And uh, see you in the next one. See ya.